Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here. You guys know what time it is. Time for a client lesson update. And remember, for those of you who like these type of videos, because many of you have said it's your favorite segment, please click like down below. Um, and a lot of times the guys who are watching these enjoy them because they're themselves personal trainers or trying to become trainers or coaches or whatever. I get a lot of that in these comments. Uh, so today let's talk about being efficient with your client's time. Because yes, we could argue that as long as you can recover from it, more is better off of a diminishing return scale. In other words, uh, training the way I train seven days a week might give me 3% more progress, 4%, maybe 5% more progress than if I just did the same training I do four days a week, right? Which people who follow my vlogs know exactly what I do. Uh, it's all documented. There's no ambiguity. You guys know what weight I lifted from my third exercise for five sets of 10 eight days ago, okay? It's all there. So over to the point with your clients, most people who can afford coaching or training have less free time. Why? Because people who are willing to pay someone to coach them, number one, usually financially stable, they usually have good careers, right? Now, I do get some college students and they find ways to scrape the money up, but generally speaking, I would say for me personally, I have more clients in the six-figure close to range, at least middle class, if not upper middle class. Uh, I do have some people who make a lot more than that, but they're people who are quite financially secure. That also means they have busy lives. Uh, a lot of them might watch my channel, but they don't have time to research everything. They can afford to pay someone to tell them what to do because they don't have time to go sitting around spending hundreds of hours researching all this stuff themselves. Okay, that's the people who hire coaches. So a lot of people are like, I wouldn't hire a coach. I could watch you. That's fine. You have the free time and to you, it's a lot of money. A lot of my clients, my coaching fees is really nothing. Okay, it, it's not a significant chunk of their income. Meaning if you're making 100000 or more a year, it's not really a big deal. It's time spent that they don't have to spend chasing their goals. But by that same token, many of these people don't have large amounts of gym time. In other words, uh, many of them at most only have four or five hours they can spend in the gym every week. So that being said, we've got to make efficient use of their time. We've got to make efficient use of their time. We have to get as much gains as possible out of that. Now, in my case, most of my people are coming to me as strength as a primary goal. Do I have some who do care about aesthetics and physique? Yes. Do I have some who don't care at all? Yeah. But realistically speaking, most guys want a little bit of both. And I've had guys who have very successfully done that. Uh, in fact, I almost want to put up some of my pictures. One of my guys who actually, he's going to be able to not be coached anymore for a while. I might put his pictures up later and crop his head and everything completely out. But he actually has obtained an aesthetic physique when our original goals were geared towards just maximizing his squat bench and deadlift. That's what he cared about. Guy ended up getting a fairly aesthetic physique uh, as a very, very, very business, busy business owner, but all we did was add extra shoulder work. He started saying, hey, I want, I want some of this. And he actually kind of obtained that look a lot of the guys want because he's not a really big guy. He's gotten quite lean and, and has obtained that shape, but we run him on conjugate. We run him on conjugate. And he does extra delt work. But what you have to do with your guys is assess this stuff of look at what their weak points are. are. What I generally do for my guys who have limited time in the gym, we spend close to 50% of their gym time working their weak points. People would say, why? Because the other lifts are going to build everything. In other words, if you're doing squat, bench, and deadlift variations, you're doing rows, right? You're, most of the muscles in your body are growing. And let's say that we do, and I'll use an example of my conjugate guys, because about 50% of my clients are on conjugate. In other words, people who aren't on conjugate probably don't have major weak points. We do general training and it's balanced training. They're usually slightly less advanced. For guys who run something like conjugate, we're already getting squatting, benching, deadlifting, and rowing in all the time. No matter what template we run, whether we run max effort and dynamic effort or max effort and repetition effort. Well, on the repetition or the dynamic effort days, those guys are getting hypertrophy through most of their body. 
So because of that, I want to spend all of their time working their weak points outside of that, other than obviously rows. I make all of them do rows. So on their max effort days, what do you think we spend all of our time doing after their max? Okay, pretty straightforward. If I have a guy who has a tricep weakness on his bench, on his max pressing day, we spend the whole day after the max doing like closed grip presses, rows, extensions. Okay, that's what he spends the whole max effort upper body day doing. Why? Because those are his weak points. There's weak points. We'll do up to 10 sets for his triceps. He might do five sets of closed grip passes, five sets of extensions after a max. If his chest is his weak link, we might end up doing five sets of floor press and maybe five sets of incline dumbbells. It depends on how he's built. And then obviously we always do rows. Okay. We spend the entire training session working weak points after the maxes. Same thing on RE days. We focus on the, on, on the weak links. If I have a guy who has weak glutes, what do you think we do? We do a bunch of glute bridges. Probably do good mornings on, on their max squat or deadlift day. A bunch of glute bridges, some good mornings, maybe some rows. Same thing, we come over to their, their repetition day or, or speed day. So they might do box squats, they might do sumo deadlift on repetition day, and then we'll do like five sets of glute bridges. And then my, a couple little minor things or bands and they get out the door. So essentially for, for most of my lifters, we spend 30%, 30 to 40% of their gym time focusing entirely upon their weakest muscles. Why? I think it's on the most bang for their buck. Because when we get over to their, their even their volume work for some of this stuff, they're going to grow off the volume. In other words, if you're squatting, benching, and deadlifting, for example, you're growing off of that. And again, we're talking about the guys who are time efficient. Because a lot of my guys, I don't have them do as much, and I have them put more focus on just straight general hypertrophy exercises by less advanced guys. More advanced guys, that's, that's, that's what we do. We come in and we focus on those because if their glutes are their weak link and say their box squat and sumo deadlift, if I put most of their efforts towards building glutes, their volume training on those things, whether it's speed or repetition, this, the numbers are going to go up. It's going to improve and everything is going to grow. Same thing on all their pressing. If their triceps are their big weak link on all their pressing, if I can build their triceps up, their pecs and delts are along for the ride because their pressing is going to go up across the board. It's making efficient use of their time. You hit the weak links hardest. The things that are the smallest and the least developed need the most work because everything else will be along for the ride if you do that. My less advanced guys who, who aren't ready for a system like that, we still do the same thing. If I have a guy whose chest is limiting his bench press tremendously, what do you think we do? We do a bunch of floor pressing and dumbbell work. Right? We spend most of their upper body time doing that. The delts are the weak link. We'll spend a bunch of time overhead pressing and or incline pressing. So on and so forth. And that's the thing. A lot of my guys realize this very quickly. We take their weak links and we hammer them into the ground. In other words, what you get for people who have limited recovery, we're not worried about getting maximum recoverable volume for everything through their body. They don't have the time for that. They don't have the time, they don't have the recovery, they oftentimes have busy, stressful lives, they have only so many hours per week they can put in the gym. So what we do, we keep everything else at its minimum effective volume to see adaptation. The bare minimum and then we take their weakest muscles to their maximum recoverable volume every single week. If it's their glutes, we train their glutes into the ground. If it's their hamstrings, they're doing 15, 20 sets for hamstrings every single week. Obviously split into a couple of sessions. It's never in one session. So in other words, if I have someone whose hamstrings are a weak link who has limited gym time, they're going to end up doing 10 sets for their hamstring of one nature or another twice a week. Your triceps are your weak link. You are probably going to be doing closed grip presses and extensions of some type 
all of your upper body workouts. You take their weakest links and you put the most work into them. Now, obviously, less advanced guys, everything is more balanced. We can put a slight bias. If they have a glaring weak link, we put more work towards it. All right, like I've said with my skinny guys, my skinny underweight guys always have weak glutes every single time. They're going to do glute bridges or hip thrusts. And they're going to do a lot of them. But that's usually when you're dealing with less advanced guys who have a glaring weakness. You might only look at one muscle and, and treat it in that regard. Everything else you can just get on there with balanced programming and balanced accessory work. All right, most of my guys' chest, we can just do bench press and either overhead press or incline depending on how they're built. That, that's all they need early on. They might need some tricep work. Um, so we can address things like that a little easier for them, but it's still the same thing. We're still putting a heavier focus on, on their weak links if we see something that stands out. Like if you get uh, a, a novice lifter who's still, you know, fairly, un, fairly small and their triceps are a weak link, obviously we can add some tricep work. We don't throw random tricep work in, we, we pick stuff. If their glutes are the weak link, we can do extra glute work and glutes are a very common weak link. Um, we can always add extra stuff. We can add extra stuff. But at the end of the day, what you're going to find is that people who can afford coaching or afford training have less time resources, right? They have less time to invest in this stuff than other people. They just simply do. Financially stable people tend to have very, very, very busy lives. Okay, they don't have time for nonsense. So that also means they don't have time to stand around and maximize every muscle to 100% of its potential in every movement at the gym. So you give them the most bang for the buck. If you can build their weak links up maximally, they will make good progress all the way down the road. So it is, it is an issue of time management. So it's a, it is an issue of being efficient versus being optimal. All right, guys, well, that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative, and I will talk to you guys next time.